Thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joey Rado, and with me, as always, is a man who never doubted Jordan Love, Mike Vanda Bogart. <laughs> uh, thank you, Joe, and thank you once again to all of our amazing listeners for tuning in. Uh, first episode of the new year, uh, cold one. It's <laughs> minus five out here in <clears throat> the uh, cream city. Um, yeah, and uh, I showed up to the studio a little earlier and realized <laughs> there was no heat on, so it was like 38 in the studio, Yeah, so and uh, we're up to 50 degrees now, so I'm going to wear my hat this whole time. It's chilly. <laughs> um, before we get going here, just a quickle, uh, quickle, a quick couple of shout-outs. Uh, so first, new Patreon supporters. We got Marissa Miller, Stacey Zamora, Carrie McGinty, and Hunter Hill. So thank you so much for supporting the show. And an episode suggestion shout out to Brooke Healy. This uh, is an interesting episode. We are filing a FOIA request too with the law enforcement agency involved. We won't uh, get into that just yet, but um, interesting case. If you want to call the show and leave a voicemail, you can call 208 391 6913. Anything you say uh, will be played on the show, especially if it's funny or mean. Can and will be used against you? <laughs> yes. In the locations and note studio. Yes. And if you would like to support the show monetarily, you can visit our Patreon page, uh, YouTube memberships, premium subscriptions on Apple. Um, <clears throat> uh, with those uh, platforms, you get extra episodes. I think we're up to the mid 40s on extra episodes. I, I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, I ordered some posters. I okay. got 10 of them. Yes. They're really nice. Are we popular enough where it would be beneficial for us to sign said posters, and would people be interested in those? What are I, your thoughts? Um, probably, <laughs> or, or will that reduce the value of the poster? Reduce the value of the poster. <laughs> but, you uh, can buy a poster for ten dollars, or we'll sign it for five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll try. We'll sell a few and see what happens. But, I figure uh, we'll just sign them and. Yeah. My kids want them, and I'm like, well, if we sell them, they get them first. I'm okay. like, I can always sign my kids a poster, but if no one wants them, I'll just give make them sure, my Make kids. sure to charge them, though. Yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the money out of their savings account <laughs> um, to yeah. pay for these great new mics, boom, yes. boom yeah, arms we, you got. We got some new equipment in the studio. I got a cough button now. So people get mad at me for coughing. So um, just like right now. <clears throat> <laughs> they I can just, still hear it on mine a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a dare. <laughs> um, outside of that, uh, I don't even know what I was talking about. So I don't yeah. know. You have any more updates? Nope. Okay. All right, everybody. Let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. March 28th, 2022, a woman from New York was traveling and hiking around Janet Longcope Park near Lee, Massachusetts. She was traveling alone, but had contact with her brother from a hotel she was staying at. When she did not respond to her brother's texts, the search began. Join us this week as we investigate the odd disappearance of Megan Marone.
Uh, just a quick correction, because our listeners are stick, sticklers for the details. Uh, she was last seen on the 27th. Oh, that's my bad. Not the 28th. <laughs> my bad. No, no problem. I was going off when I thought she had last contact. <clears throat> well, I, I just got to do better research. Why are we talking our NPR voices? <laughs> I know. <laughs> so the, this, this case takes place in Janet Logcote Park. It's a 46-acre park near Beartown State Forest, uh, about 4.5 miles, and the Appalachian Trail. Oh, and I looked that up. It, Appalachian Trail is about 8 miles. 8 miles. Awesome. So it's right, right in that area of Massachusetts. Uh, it was established in 1963. Uh, Miss Janet Longcoat uh, donated the 46 acres to the town of Lee to be preserved as conservation land. Uh, they don't have a record of visitors per year. It is a very, very small park, but still just barely meets our criteria for what we look for in the show. There was outdoors involved. So now we're going to talk about interesting facts. Uh, I Massachusetts. skipped the history for Massachusetts because we could do like a 30-part episode series uh, on. We should I mean, just do a whole other podcast because I love. I mean, it's basically like the founding of the United States. Yeah, most of you have learned about it in school. <laughs> a lot of it took place in Massachusetts. Oh, yeah. Boston's one of my favorite cities. I go on the Freedom Trail like yeah. every time I go. All right. On March 10th. And uh, these are interesting facts about Massachusetts. I'm so cold, I can't talk. I know, it is freezing. <laughs> <laughs> On March 10th, 1876 in Boston, the first telephone call was made when Alexander Graham Bell summoned his lab assistant, Thomas A. Watson. On a phone, he said, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. Watson was in the next room where he heard the message from the receiver. In a letter to his father, he wrote, The day is coming when telegraph wires will be laid onto houses just like water or gas, <laughs> and friends will converse with each other without leaving home. That's how he talked. Little did they know where it would go. Yes, I know. And um, here we, yeah, it, it, it resulted in this, to, to this podcast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they would have thrown it all away. Yeah. Like, this is how you used my technology. Uh, the first college for higher education was Harvard University, founded in Massachusetts in 1636. Um, Mike's very proud of that. He's a Harvard man. In 1820... Har Harvard, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> in Harvard, 1826. Or in 1826, Massachusetts became home to the first railroad in the United States. Uh, Boston Common is the oldest public park in the United States of America. Officially opening in 1634, the 50 acre uh, 50 acres of land is a common gathering place throughout the year. I didn't know it was officially the oldest park. Yeah, I didn't either. Uh, Percy Spencer, an engineer from the Waltham uh, from Waltham, accidentally discovered the technology that would lead to the microwave. He was testing magnetrons in a vacuum tube and generated microwaves. Uh, the chocolate chip cookie was invented by Ruth Graves in Wakefield and her husband uh, and her husband in 1930 in the Toll House Restaurant in Whitman, Massachusetts. Hmm. I wonder if that's why those I cookies wonder, are. Yeah, I wonder if that Toll House, cookie. Toll House cookies. Interesting. <laughs> Probably. Uh, Plymouth, located just south of modern day Boston, was one of the first pr uh, permanent English settlements in North America. Uh, there is a lake in Massachusetts named. This one's for you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna. Okay, here we go. It's real. I looked it up. I know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna copy it, and we're gonna do our little, our little thing here. Uh, Chargoga, Gaga, Manchu. Manchu Am I going to try it, or are oh, you going to try with me? You can go. <laughs> Man, Manchuga, Guga, Chow, Bana, Gunga, Maug. <laughs> <laughs> How the heck do you say that? Do you did you look it up and know how to say it? Uh no. No? All right. Um Do you want to keep going with facts while I look this up? Because I want to hear sure. I want to hear computers. <laughs> um so another interesting fact is it's illegal to in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to scare a pigeon. Ooh. Um <laughs> I would like to admit on the air right now I am very guilty of potentially scaring, scaring pigeons, pigeons in Boston. I've been there for a while. It's possible. <laughs> All right, Joe's typing it in. Let's old. see here. Here it goes. Let's see. Let's see what it's. Where's the play button on this? That sounds like it could be a thing. Hold on. Char. <laughs> I can't. Char. 
I'm gonna do it one more time and then I'm moving on because it's just hurting okay. my brain. Char gaga gog man chaga gog chow bana ganga mog. Char gaga mong baga gaga mong char gaga ganga mog. People better it's, not get mad at your pronunciation. Oh, they will. Their their Bostonians are lose their minds. They're gonna like, crash their cars over this <laughs> more than they already do. There, I just <laughs> threw that one at you. you. Guys are terrible drivers. I'm just saying because I really love that city. It's one of my favorite cities. Uh, it is illegal. You already did that one. Yeah. In Massachusetts, uh, it is illegal to have a goatee unless you have obtained a permit to wear a goatee in public. You must pay a fee first. That uh, <laughs> just shows how far we've fallen as a society. Right. In the place where our freedoms were established, you can no longer walk around without a goatee permit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't know how old that law is. could be really old. I want to know who that was made for. It was there probably was, some like spiteful politician that was getting back at another guy. That like he goatee. couldn't, yeah, he couldn't grow a goatee. <laughs> yeah. And this other guy was just really pompous about his goatee yeah. and he just passed a law. And he probably had to convince all the other politicians. To, no, he like, probably snuck it in as a provision and yeah. no one noticed it. And he's like, aha! And he made the guy pay, so be, literally. Be careful about the facial hair in uh, Boston. I might have to look that one up. We could do a patron and talk about that one. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the uh, climate in the area. So the climate of Massachusetts, it's mainly a humid continental climate with hot, humid summers and cold, snowy winters and abundant precipitation. Massachusetts receives about 43 inches or 1,090 millimeters of rain annually. Did you just include millimeters to make it sound like a lot? Um. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Fairly evenly distributed throughout the year, slightly wetter during the winter. Summers are warm with an average high temperature in July above 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and overnight lows above 60 degrees Fahrenheit common, are common throughout the state. Winters are cold but generally less extreme on the coast with the high temperatures in the winter averaging above freezing even in January, although areas further inland are much colder. The state does have extreme temperatures from time to time with 100 degree Fahrenheit uh, temperatures being reached in the summer. And temperatures below zero in the winter are not unusual. The state has its share of extreme weather prone to nor'easters and to severe winter storms. Summers can bring thunderstorms, averaging around 30 days of thunderstorm activity per year. Massachusetts averages one tornado per year. Uh, and Massachusetts, like the entire United States, eastern seaboard is vulnerable to hurricanes. It's much weaker when they get up there, usually. <clears throat> Despite its small size, uh, Massachusetts features numerous topographically distinct regions. The large coastal plain of the Atlantic Ocean in the eastern section of the state contains Greater Boston, along with most of the state's population, as well as the distinctive Cape Cod Peninsula. To the west lies the hilly, rural region of central Massachusetts, and beyond that, the Connecticut River Valley. Along the western border of western Massachusetts lies the highest elevated part of the state, the Berkshires, forming a portion of the northern terminus of the Appalachian Mountains. The highest point in Massachusetts is Mount Greylock at 3,491 feet. So what are some of the dangers you'd expect to see in Massachusetts? They have an American black bear, coyote, bobcat, moose, timber rattlesnake, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. Timber rattlesnakes are considered to be one of the most dangerous animals in the eastern part of the United States. Their large size, long fangs, and high venom delivery means they pack a potent punch. Immediately after the snake delivers its bite, the venom will start to cause pain, swelling, excessive bleeding, and various neurological symptoms. Because the venom prevents the wound from properly closing, there is a small chance that a person would bleed out and die, so medical attention should be sought immediately. Uh, they do have the eastern copperhead. While bites can potentially be fatal, this species isn't normally that aggressive, and the venom has relatively low potency. It also may deliver a non-toxic warning bite first. So nice of it. That is really, really, really sweet. <laughs> warning bite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the northern black widow spider. Uh, the adult female black widow is one of the few venomous spiders in Massachusetts. While the venom is rarely fatal, it can lead to painful symptoms including, cramp, including cramps, spasms, and muscle pain. Uh, there's the blue shark, the hammerhead shark, tiger shark, and great white shark. We are spending most of our time on the land, so those are irrelevant, as well as the jellyfish. But if you've seen Jaws, I think that takes place in Cape Cod. I I don't remember. Uh, I can't remember, but this is we're gonna get in trouble for research on that one. <laughs> I'll look um, I've been stung by a jellyfish several times before. That's not fun. Doesn't sound fun. <clears throat> no, 
So uh, difficulty in the area. Uh, the area where Megan went missing is relatively small and mostly uh, bordered by roads. So it's it's not a difficult area to hike in. Uh, it's not a popular hiking spot, and outside of the immediate locals, not very well known at all. Based on the accounts from locals, the area is heavily wooded. The trail is a uh, gentle one-mile loop, one plus, a little bit more than a mile, and it goes through hemlocks, pines, and some wetlands. Basically, what I got from reading about this little park, this trail really is nothing like difficult compared to some of the stuff we've talked about. It's like a walk in a park. Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not being. Yeah, it's heavily wooded, and I mean, you wouldn't want to go off trail based on the accounts of locals, but sure. it's nothing that you should have any trouble with. At the time of the year that she went, there was a real bad storm going on, so that could have factored in. But by all accounts, this should have been a very easy, quick hike. Okay, so. Now, now, before you start giving us the Megan profile, you have to say the name of this lake. <laughs> I, I pass. Char gaga gog man chaga gog chow bana ganga mog. If anybody living or living near this lake is listening to this, please call in and give us your take on how to pronounce that. Oh, just say it. Just uh, I want a bunch now, of phone calls of people calling in and saying it. When you Google this lake, it has like a normal name, but this is I think it's like its official name. Oh, nice. You know there's people that, like, spent time to learn it, and you all should... What's the number again? Have them call in. I'll look it up real quick because I know you have to go to your... Character profile. Your character profile, but it is 208-391-6913. I'm actually showing you on the screen, so if you're watching... Why don't you look up the the lake on Google while I go in the character profile? I will, and then um, I want everyone... I want even people not from Massachusetts to call in and pronounce this, because that would be fun just to have a ton of calls of people trying to pronounce this word. Because I'm I'm guessing Google's wrong. This is probably not how it's pronounced. Oh, yeah, Google's wrong a lot of the time. It's got the right emphasis on the wrong syllable or something like that. So I'll look this up. You tell us a little bit more about Megan. All right, so jumping right into the character profile, um, we don't know a ton about what she actually was wearing the day she went missing. But um, So her name was Megan Amanda Marone. Um, she was last seen on... March 27th of 2022, her remains have been found. We will get into that a little later. She was a female, age 42. She was five foot six, 120 pounds. She had auburn hair, green eyes. Um, we have quite a bit <clears throat> about her history and personality from one of her good friends wrote a, a Substack article on her after her disappearance, kind of talking about um, her life and kind of, you know, almost kind of like a tribute to her. Um, so Megan was known for her deep thinking and sensitive spirit. Her, um, She spent most of her adult life in higher education across <clears throat> Russell Sage College in Albany, New York, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University in Madison, New Jersey, and Seton Hall University in South Orange, New Jersey. Uh, she also freelanced through... Rep- uh, she also was a freelance reporter and photographer for the Hudson Valley-based um, Wallkill Valley Times and Chronogram. As she was involved in also numerous organizations, including uh, Facing History and Ourselves, Jewish Labor Committee, and Democracy Now! Productions. A past students always described um, how quirky she was um, when, when they would, you know, she would greet you how decorated her room um, was, and it, she wanted to do that as more of an oasis than a teaching space. Uh, her love, she had a love for music, literature, art, philosophy, and poetry all uh, came together in her classes. So um, she was very passionate about, you know, teaching and her students, which is cool. We all probably remember a teacher from growing up that uh, had an impact on our lives one way or the other, so that that's really cool. Um, she was from... Uh, New York, and uh, this is kind of occupation history. She received Teacher of the Year numerous times from New Jersey's uh, Chatham High School, which um, I heard is a very good high school. Uh, a bulk of her teaching career was spent at the high-ranking school uh, with her stay spanning over a decade until June 2017. Within this uh, school uh, community, she advised over the Philosophy Club. 
uh, philosophy club. I can't talk. Um, and let's see here from 2013 until June, 2017, she served as an adjunct professor of English education at, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson university. Once to party New Jersey in 2017, she reloaded, relocated to Troy, New York, where she helped mentor youths, um, with the sanctuary for independent media. And she also started the Troy P- poem project in 2014 And was a consultant for a little creative class geared towards inclusivity uh, and the full realized potential within young people. In 2018, she returned to the classroom, this time at Shaker High School in Latham, New York. And she had been teaching there uh, ever since. We don't know a ton about her experience in the wilderness, though friends and family did say she was an avid hiker, so... um, you know, we could assume at a base level she's done this before, uh, especially the hike that she was going on in Longcoat uh, Park would have been, you know, a breeze for her. So um, we don't really know if she's been to this place before, um, and we don't know if she had any medical conditions. Uh, that information was not available during my research. So... Yeah, they don't even call it a park. It's called Long Cope Property. Yeah. And, you know, you can see that it, it's kind of in more of a suburban area. Yeah, I'm you know, zooming out a little bit here. Yeah, it's like in, there's golf courses around it. There's but there's hotels. also a state park just south, four miles. That's your Beartown State Park right there, that big. Yeah. So, I mean. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, ha- it's a smaller t- town, obviously. Yeah. Um. Okay. It's just, yeah, it's just, we, we don't typically get ones that are kind of in the city. Yeah. Other than that one um, area near LA that we covered once. Yeah. LA. <laughs> get some tacos. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So we're going to jump right into timeline here. And again, I'm going to reference some comments that Megan made before her disappearance. And this was uh, described in. Um, that substack by a gentleman who goes by the name of Chris Hedges. So he wrote about Megan's disappearance and he did mention this. So uh, he had written that a few days before she disappeared, she confided to friends that she had gone into hiding to escape from a man who had brutally harassed her and intimidated her to the point that, um, or intimidated her because she wouldn't sleep with him. And she said She was too afraid to stay at home, especially when she saw him drive by her house. She uh, was granted a leave from teaching and camped out at the Red Lion Inn in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So our timeline begins on Thursday, March 24th, 2022. So she checked into the Red Lion Inn. Uh, Like I said, it's in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And she intended to leave on Wednesday, March 30th. Uh, Again, some of the local news reports stated she checked in on the 26th. According to family members running the Find Megan Marone website, this was not correct. The correct date that she checked in was the 24th. So we're going to go off of what they said. Um, During this time, Megan was on a scheduled leave from her job at Shaker High, where she teaches English uh, just outside of uh, Lantham, New York. Peter uh, Naple, her brother, uh, shared that she took the trip as a getaway in the midst of emotional upset and obviously being harassed and stalked uh, is a a terrifying thing for anybody and um, it's very understandable that she kind of wanted to get out of town, get away for a few days, clear her head. If she was an avid hiker, um, probably, you know, going to this place in Massachusetts and doing some hiking would be a great way to kind of reset. So So she was getting away from somebody in New York. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like an unknown man that I never was able to get a description of or anything like that was harassing her because she wouldn't sleep with him. So um, zoom out farther and see how far this is from New York. It was New York City or just somewhere in New York State? New York State. Lantham. Lantham. New York. 
All right, keep going. But she lived in, um, where did I say she lived? I think I said um, she was from Del Mar, which is a suburb of Bethlehem, New York. Del Mar. Okay, Del Mar, New York. A hamlet. Hamlet, yep. It's a, there it is. Yep. Okay, so it's not too far of a drive. Okay. I mean, yeah, find, it's, it's find still getting Find where Shaker away. High is. I'm just curious now. I didn't actually look it up. Um, so I'll keep going here. Shaker High School oh. in Latham. Okay. Yeah, it's in the same same city. Yeah. And that's not too far from Longcoat Park in Massachusetts. Well, I mean, there's Lee right here. Oh. So. Looks like maybe, what, 100 miles? I'll do as the crow flies. It's like, say, roughly. Oh, not even. Yeah, it's like. I, well, so, as a crow as flies, crow like flies. 40, 50 miles. Okay, so, so it's, shorter than a trip to Chicago for us. Yeah, let's say two hours Okay, being conservative. So yeah. it's not crazy distance. Okay. So jumping back into timeline here, it is now Saturday, March 26th, 2022. It's in the evening. So Peter, remember Peter is her brother, texted Megan Saturday night, and everything seemed fine. However, he uh, began the girl worried when he got no response the next day. So it is now Sunday, March 27th, 2022. Uh, The last known person to speak to Megan was a hotel employee who gave her directions around 10 a.m., Peter said. Shortly after, there was no activity on her phone and uh, or her bank accounts. Oh, it's only a 50-minute drive. Okay. So it's, it's, I mean, for Wisconsin, I mean, a lot of those places are real close. I, yeah. I, I drove more than that today. <laughs> yeah, I like double. Yeah. I was yeah. up in Sheboygan. Yeah. Sheboygan. Yeah. Say that listeners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, like I said, the last known person to talk to Megan was an employee at the hotel at around 10 AM on the 27th. Then, based on the personal account of local Lee resident John Siak, um, it's believed that Megan's car arrived uh, at the parking lot for Longcoat Park sometime before noon. Uh, and this stuck out to him because uh, that day there was a terrible storm with heavy wind, rain, snow, and John said the sight of a car there seemed odd. It just wasn't the kind of day that somebody would go hiking. And Megan drove a 2017 Black Subaru Impreza with New York plates. It's now Monday, March 28th, 2022. So Peter still hasn't heard from his sister, so he decides to call the inn to have them check on her. When they entered her room, her bed was made and all of her belongings were still there. So very odd. She obviously has not been back to her room. Uh, It's now Tuesday, March 29th of 2022, John and his wife, uh, Kathy, returned to the Subaru to investigate. Uh, John was quoted as saying, it just didn't look right, he said, uh, standing outside his home uh, near where the street meets Route 102 in South Lee. He said, it looked like somebody dumped it there. When he peered through the glass, he saw some clothes, a box of film CDs, and a pair of shoes. It was noted uh, by law enforcement later on that the car keys, the hotel key, her daily diary... Her good luck stuffed animal bun, her computer, her wallet, uh, the book she was reading, uh, and cell phone were missing. And we do have a last ping on her cell phone, um, and it did not come from the park itself. It it came uh, from the rural residential area across the road. Um, So. Oh, that's right here. Yeah. So John then decided to try, you know, checking the door of the car uh, to see if it was unlocked. And sure enough, it was unlocked. So that immediately prompted him to call 911. Now, Megan's family does not believe she would have purposely left the car unlocked. Her brother called it very unusual. uh, And like I said, her keys are not recovered with the vehicle. Peter would go on to say that Megan may have gone to check out the area, but probably planned to return to the car before going on the on a hike. He was quoted as saying she always made sure that the car was locked before she went out on the on a hike and the car was unlocked. Peter added that Megan's hiking boots were still in her car, uh, which he said was a little strange for Megan. 
So now, according to the Massachusetts State Police, her family reported her missing on this day and police quickly located her car at the Longco Park Trailhead. However, I did read an earlier police statement from April of 2022 that stated her car was found by law enforcement on March 27th. So my guess is whoever typed up that report and posted it on Facebook just had the the date slightly wrong. So I'm guessing this is the trailhead. Okay. This is along this road. I mean, when I back out, there's nothing else here. Yeah. And I couldn't even see this on the map. I was just going up the map on Google Earth. Yeah, and I mean, you'll it's, see when I zoom out. it's like, thick. Oh, no, that could be no, someone's that driveway. Like somebody's house. Yeah, so you gotta go farther down. Yeah, it was down. So um Okay. I'm thinking I'll keep, I'll keep going. I'm gonna this is where I was because she said it was in the residential area. These are only the few houses that are across the street on Church Street. Yeah. And the rest of it when I go further south, I'll I'll keep going to see if I can find a trailhead. Yeah. But uh there's like nothing else. It's pretty thick. And I put some pictures in there. There's one picture okay. of the trail sign. So Okay. I'll um, I'll pull that up in a minute. Yeah. I just want to shoot so, so this is pretty thick. Yeah. It's uh yeah, thick forest. Oh, here oh, we there go. There you go. I think th- yep. That's got to be it. I think that is it. That's yeah, there that's we go. the sign. That's probably where she parked. Oh yeah, there's some houses here. Okay. Yeah. So, um weeks of searching were conducted after she was reported missing by the Lee Police, Lee Fire the Massachusetts State Police, uh, Mass- Massachusetts State Police Canine and Air Wing, the Mass- Massachusetts State Police Special Emergency Response Team, Berkshire County Sheriff's Office, Albany County Sheriff's Department, and the Berkshire Mountain Search and Rescue Team. But they unfortunately found no clues on Megan. Uh, their neighborhood and the woods that border it went into a computerized mapping and tracking grid. They used sonar on a privately owned pond and divers went in to comb the bottom and they had canine units sniffing around it and still found nothing. So it is now uh, Wednesday, March 30th of 2022. And I have a couple statements here from the Massachusetts state police Uh, They are quoted as saying, Lee police officers, members of the MSP Special Emergency Response Team, MSP K-9 team, and MSP Air Wing Helicopter and troopers from the State Police Lee Barracks, along with other local responders, conducted a search yesterday afternoon and evening in the area of Church Street and the park. Yesterday's search concluded shortly before 10 p.m. and troopers and officers returned to the area this morning to resume. The MSP's special emergency response team is trained to conduct search and rescue missions in outdoor environments with challenging terrain features. Troopers from the state police detective unit for Berkshire County are also on the scene. It is now Thursday, March 31st of 2022, and we have another, we actually have uh, several updates from the Massachusetts State Police. So first update was from 6.04 a.m., Uh, They were quoted as saying, Yesterday's search in Lee concluded without locating Megan, who has been missing since Sunday. There is no further search of Longcoat Park area planned at this time, (coughs) barring the uh, development of new information. Now we have a second update that came at 10.56 a.m. Based on newly developed information, members of the MSP Special Emergency Rescue Team and K-9 Team's have resumed a search in South Lee in connection with Miss Marone's disappearance. The search location is different from the area searched the previous two days and is about a half a mile from where her car was found. We will update on the results of the search later today. And we get a final update that day at 7.36 p.m. So they said search and canine teams did not locate Miss Marone in several hours of searching a police will resume their searching in the morning. So um, basically, you know, they had quite, you know, I think the number I saw was several dozen searchers in the area. <clears throat> Joe's got some pictures of the actual uh, search going on and they found absolutely nothing. And like I said, there was quite a bit of her stuff that was missing along with her. So computer, wallet, um, phone. But not her hiking stuff. Not her hiking stuff. Her boots were still in the car. That's wild. Um, so very interesting that 
<clears throat> all that stuff is missing. Uh, they didn't find any evidence of her. And, you know, it is pr- pretty thick vegetation. Um, yeah, at least they can see, though. Yeah. Like, th- looking at this time of year. Like yeah. it's it's But, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on the like, ground coverage. You know, not to minimize anything, but it's a 46-acre area. Yeah, it's not small. It's not small, but it's not... It's not huge either. It's not like Yellowstone or yeah. the Tetons or something. So you would think that if she was out there and something had happened to her, even if she had gone off trail, they probably <clears throat> would find her. We're not talking really crazy terrain in the sense that mm-hmm. there's areas where searchers couldn't get to. Um so, and they were pretty much... I think it just shows how difficult it is to do those types of searches. Yeah, I mean... It's a small area, kind of in a city. Yeah. And and it, they were pretty quick in getting out there. Yeah. As soon as she was reported missing. Um, so, obviously, nothing had been found. So, now we're going to, you know, fast forward to Thursday, September 1st, um, 2022. And this is a statement by the Massachusetts State Police. On Thursday evening, a civilian discovered partial remains in a heavily wooded area near Fox Drive in Lee. Lee Police, the state police detective unit assigned to the Berkshire District Attorney's Office, the Berkshire District Attorney's Office, the Massachusetts State Police Special Emergency Response Team, and the Massachusetts State Police Crime Scene Services Section responded to the scene. Police have since located additional remains believed to be those of the same missing person. Uh, these remains are presumed to be of 42-year-old Megan Marone, who was reported missing on March 29th. The office of the chief medical medical examiner in Boston identified Marone through dental records and a forensic anthropological. I'm having trouble with this word. Anthropological. Yes. Examination showed that the remains are the same sex, ancestry, and stature of Marone. I also found a blog from what I believe is a friend, close friend of Megan. They must have grown up together, who mentioned that um, in they that they discovered the remains were a skull and a few other bones, which a skull makes sense because they use dental records. Um, but I didn't find anything official from the police stating exactly what they found. But it sounds like a skull and a couple bones. Okay, we don't know what part of the body the bones are from or anything. Um, now, according to a news report from ABC 10, toxicology testing revealed that she did have a presence of THC in her blood, um, which first I find amazing that those just partial remains, they were able to detect that. Um, but I also, it stays in your system for a while. Yeah. And I was also, Massachusetts is a legal state. New York is too, right? I, I don't know, but I was just thinking like in 2022, um, this, I added it in here because it was part of a news report, but I don't think it has any bearing on the case. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think it had any effect on what happened. Anyone that's been hiking enough has been around lots of different people that are doing that. <laughs> as you walk by the trail, you can smell it. It's not yeah. a big deal. So, um, I just thought I should mention it because that was the only substance that was found in her blood. Okay. Based on the toxicology report. Uh, so the autopsy, <clears throat> whatever autopsy they could do, uh, also didn't show any signs of pre-death trauma, and the medical examiner could not determine the cause or manner of death due to the condition of the remains. Um, but the police throughout this time continued to state that, her, that there was no evidence that indicates foul play. So um, it's now March 27th of 2023, so not that long ago. Exactly one year since Megan was last seen, uh, before she died, the Berkshire District Attorney says the office is still investigating some elements of her death. They were quoted as saying, we are still investigating certain portions of the case. DA Timothy uh, Shugru said in a response to questions about the case through his, his spokeswoman. Uh, neither he nor office spokeswoman Julia uh, Saburin would elaborate or answer questions about whether the office would rule out f- foul play. So Joe and I will be filing a FOIA request with the um, Massachusetts State Police because they were the leading investigator on this case to try and get the police report of her disappearance, the search, and the recovery of the remains because I think it's really interesting that they 
over and over say that no foul play was indicated, yet the case remains open and the district attorney's office is very cagey about if foul play was a factor. So, you know, do they have a suspect in the case that they're still investigating or do they know more about what's going on? Do they have evidence maybe from her cell phone or emails that, you know, do they know the individual that was harassing her? Things like that. Now, I don't know that we'll get anything out of it. If it's an active investigation, they'll probably just deny the request. Um, and from what I've read on FOIA requests to the state police in Massachusetts, they're pretty bad about FOIA requests. So, Oh, we just put them on blast. <laughs> so, no. I'm we, not going to be allowed in Massachusetts anymore now, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. So, <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so, we will file that. And those, if anyone, we've filed them in the past and they, they don't move quickly. It could be a year before we get a response. Yeah, because they have to respond, right? They do but have to. But there's to, no time frame. No, and, and what they what the what I've read they have done in the past is they uh, the first four hours is free, and then they charge you twenty five dollars an hour, and then uh, some people have paid the fee only to get kind of stonewalled and that they can't they won't release any information, and so they you know they play some games. So uh, we'll we'll see what happens because this it's very interesting to me that. Um, there, the well, I guess we'll jump right into theories, and I'll just kind of talk here for a second. That her, the the whole circumstance of how she went missing is very suspect to me. She left her hometown because of she felt like physically threatened by an unknown individual who was stalking her, and she goes to a different state, and she goes to hike in this park that's you know, a very easy hike um, if you stay on trail. And um, her car is left there unlocked, something very unusual that her family says she would never do. A lot of her possessions are missing, but the things she would need for hiking are still in the car. Um, they search and search. They find nothing in the park. And then five months later, they discover partial remains not that far from where her car was. It all just seems very suspect, and it's very odd that they're so quick to rule out foul play initially, and now they're kind of, they won't answer questions on it, yet the investigation's still open. I'm trying to find this Fox Drive. So it's, move your mouse, like, kind of east. East? East. It's. Like, here's Longco property. Yeah, we're over more to your right. Like, nope, too far. Like, oh, move, I'm moving the whole it, thing. Like, it's in that area. A little more to your right. It's somewhere in there. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, it's like a dirt road? Yeah, some Fox Drive. It's not even on Google Maps. It's, okay. It was in that in a wooded area somewhere <coughs> in that. All right, well, here's a road going right through here. Yeah. Or I bet that's power lines. Yeah. Yeah. Or power lines or, or a railroad track. <clears throat> and did I put a – I thought I put a, something in there that You put her where her maps. car was. Oh, okay. So that's fine. I wanted to get an idea. So, yeah, I, it's in that wooded area like to the Here's right. the inn she was at. Yeah, the red line inn. Yeah, and the only one it put up here was like a road up here, which is too far away. Okay, so, so it's on property. Not on the long coat property. Not technically, but it's like it's in this in area? In vicinity. Okay. It was like a half a mile, I want to say, from where her car was found. Oh, really? Okay, her car was here. Yeah. Yeah, it was like in there somewhere. Okay, well, here's half mile. Yeah. Radius. So... Yeah, it would be past the power lines. And I actually found Fox Drive. It, like, put a marker there. It just put, like, Fox Drive, Ma Lee, Massachusetts. Oh. Did I just lose connection to my <laughs> Fox Drive? <laughs> Fox Drive. Um, so while Joe's doing that, I do have a statement from her brother, Peter. Um, so... He wrote this on the GoFundMe page uh, after her remains were found. So he wrote, as most of you are already aware, it's been determined that the remains found near Lunco Park are that of our beloved Megan. Our family is deeply mourning her loss and trying to wrap our heads around what our lives will be without her. We are still no closer to gaining any insight into what happened to her, and that has been incredibly frustrating for us. There are even more questions than 
before her body was found, uh, in fact. The lack of communication from law enforcement has been incredibly hard to bear. We thank you all for your continued support to our family and to Megan. And one side bar here, her brother does not think it was suicide. So he said he has no clue what happened to his sister, but he's keeping everything on the table until authorities say otherwise, except suicide. He was quoted as saying, if Megan was to do something like that, she would have left a note because she is a writer. Um, so he also went on to say that uh, the scenarios are endless in that Megan could have been abducted or might have fallen and hit her head while hiking in the dense forest. So um, they, her brother, who knew her the best, ruled out suicide. And she was a very like poetic person. I literally saw... Uh, just looking for images of hers, like her with signs of poetry and stuff. So yeah. I would imagine she would write something if that were the case. That's what her her brother was kind of getting at. So um, I, in my theory, I think it wasn't suicide. I mean, based on her, co- her, I agree with you on her that. comments to her friends, she was literally scared that somebody was going to harm her. So she was getting out of town. Um, so I don't think she got injured in the park, even though she was hiking, she parked her car or the car. We don't know that she technically parked the car herself. They just know that they think the car got there around noon on the 27th. There was no, nothing I found that said, yeah, we saw her drive her car in there. Okay. They just know. I think they said that they went by there earlier and it wasn't there. And then around noon, they drove by and saw the car there. I could be wrong. I searched. I went through dozens of articles on this case. Um, that's why I'd love to get the police report. Um, so it's odd that they're not being very forthcoming. Yeah. It's not like it's a huge town and they have tons of stuff going on, I'm guessing. Well, and it's not I even, could be wrong. If the person who was stalking her is from where she's from in New York, that person's not even from Lee, Massachusetts. So it's not even someone from the town. It's an out-of-towner from a different state. That, so you're saying if this was this stalker, this person? I mean, based on her comment, so let me read what she wrote. She told her friend again. Um, she went into hiding to escape from a man who had brutally harassed and intimidated her because she wouldn't sleep with him. Um, he would drive by her house. Uh, so... I mean, that sounds pretty serious. Yeah. And could this guy have known she was going to Massachusetts or, like, followed her? Like, if you, you know, stalking her enough, he knew her, like, whereabouts? I think if we go down the rabbit hole, I mean, I've heard these stories. I know they're rare, but this could be one of the cases where it happens where did he put some sort of tracking device on her car? Yeah. If he's If he's driving by her house a lot and really obsessed with her, that could be a case where it's somebody like that. And if he sees that she's driving somewhere, put a tracker on her. Yeah, find out where the car. hotel she's at. Find out what she's doing. Yeah. Um, I don't like. I said I don't think she got injured hiking. Um, even though her car was parked on a day it was really stormy, I don't think she would have gone hiking that day if she was an avid hiker and was experienced. Why would you go out on a day that was super windy and rainy and snowy in March in Massachusetts? You wouldn't. Um. And she was on a leave of absence. Like, it's not like she had to do it that day. It's, you know, it's not like if we went hiking, like that time in Glacier where it was raining and we're like, oh, we're doing it because we're here. Yeah. Like, we have to hike. Yep. <laughs> Our permits have specific dates. We yeah. got to do them regardless. Yeah. I don't, th- I, I think if she would have gotten injured, I think they would have found her pretty quickly. Um, if, if she was in that 46 acre <clears throat> section, I think they would have found her with the amount of people they had in there. I'm almost wondering. Half miles, not that far. Yeah. Is it possible? This might be more, I don't even consider it off the deep end, but more of like a Hollywood story. Did her stalker follow her out there? Yeah. Was stalking her while she's going around to a hotel, watching her movements. For whatever reason, she's driving over to that park. Um, gets out of her car, maybe to check out just the entrance. Yeah. And he pulls up too and starts chasing her. Okay. 
like what if she saw him and started running? Because she didn't have any of her hiking stuff, but yeah. she had some stuff. Yep. So I'm just trying to think of if you're in a new place and she hasn't been there before, she parks her car across the street. It's right at the trail entrance. You know, it's a residential area. It's not yeah. like get out of the car. Didn't lock the car. Yeah. Walk into the trailhead a few steps. It looked like there was like a rest area maybe. Like just to go check it out. Like if again, if it's stormy, you know what I, you know what I would do? Get out, look around. Yeah. Get a feeling for the environment. Do I want to go on a hike today? Do I not? Make your decision. If you decide to, go back to your car, get your gear on, and then go out for a day hike. Yeah. Now, imagine she gets out of her car to go do that, and this guy comes up, and she just books it into the woods. Yeah. No direction, no nothing. Just runs. You, I could run, especially if I'm terrified. Yeah. A half mile is okay. You do that in a, in a few minutes if you're sprinting yeah Yeah, i'm saying if you if you got fight or flight like what if she's running from him and he catches her yeah and i don't want to go into details but like honestly that's my gut reaction of okay if this stalker did follow her yeah granted there has to this is a lot of hearsay this is he had to put a tracker in her car or somehow know where she was yeah go to the hotel and then be watching her constantly monitoring her seeing where she's going and waiting for that opportunity yeah uh, and if it was a rainy day, no one was at the park except for her. She gets out and he just chases her down. Yeah. And I mean, if this, it sounds like this individual who was stalking her is disturbed anyways. Well, that's kind of what I'm getting at is like, yeah. if someone's like that crazy, we're not talking about normal people because no. normal people would think like, no, yeah, I'm not going to drive an hour, but well, yeah. you're a normal person. That's why. Of yeah. course you wouldn't do that. Uh, if there's somebody that's constantly driving by someone's house and obsessed with them. Yeah. I mean, there's been crazier stories. Yep. It happens to celebrities a lot. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it, the person that was stalking her could have some kind of uh, mental condition that's causing them to act this way. We don't know. Yeah. We don't know anything about the person that was stalking her, which is kind of frustrating. That's my theory on the stalker. Honestly, I don't really have one. Any anytime else other than And do we did like the, what what happened? Did the police were they able to get any kind of fingerprints from the car other than hers? Yeah, that's that's what makes it difficult. Why why won't they release information? The I mean, the only thing I can think of is they originally didn't think it was foul play. They think, okay, she went hiking out in a storm and she just succumbed to the elements and we just haven't found her. Yeah. Um because I don't think originally this information about the person stalking and harassing her was known. Because this guy who wrote this on his sub stack wrote this after the or she disappeared. Okay. So I'm wondering if since her disappearance and the information about this person harassing her came out and then her remains are found, the state police have more information they're letting on and maybe they don't want to alert the suspect yet because they're gathering evidence or something because they, they probably have her cell phone records and email records at this point. Yeah. Um, I'm sure this person didn't just drive by her house. He probably was calling and texting. Well, and someone ends up and, dead. And then the one thing that's out of the ordinary is he recently was dealing with some sort of stalker to the point where she had to hide. Yeah. That seems like a person of interest. Yeah. I'm not a police officer, nor a lawyer, nor any part of the judicial system, but I've watched enough television. <laughs> but then at, at some point, you know, I'd be, I really be curious to know if they found fingerprints of anyone else on the car. Does that mean someone else drove the car there and left it? Or did she drive? The, I, I like your theory a bit that, like, whoever was stalking her followed her there, and she got out to check it out, and that's when that person made their their move and she ran off into the woods and maybe ran in the direction of where her remains were found. Yeah. Um, but I really care. There's a lot of missing pieces to the puzzle that we don't know. Um, and if they do have a suspect, they've got it, you know, why haven't they, have they brought them in for questioning? Have they, you know, done some background investigation on this person? How long has this been going on? Um, how well did we'll, we'll Meg, have to wait did, a year for a FOIA request to be responded? Did Megan to. know this person, or was it some random person? Did she? How long did she know this person potentially? Uh, My guess is she had to have known him now. Well, yeah, TBD. But if she's saying 
she must have developed some form of relationship. He wanted to take it a step further. She didn't, is like what it maybe, sounds like. Maybe they worked together, or maybe they were friends. Because she was involved in a bunch of different organizations. and um, It's all just things that I really want to know. Different pieces of information that you wonder if the state police know this stuff or not. Yeah. I, I'm guessing they did, because they probably have to reach out to her friends and family. And if she wrote a blog post about it, I'm sure her friend talked to the police and... Yeah, told them about that. That seems like, and it you was, know, after this happens, we've worked with families where things like this have happened, where people have gone missing, and the first thing in all of them is all they do. The families start talking to everybody that they can, friends, people that knew them, to get information. So, yeah. guaranteed, her brother connected with her friend who told him if he didn't already know about it. Yeah, uh, told him about the guy, and I'm sure he brought that to the police. Yeah. So I'd be interested if um, what he or her would say about how the police are handling it or how they responded, because it sounds like they're being pretty close to the chest, which, again... You can even tell in the state... There could be the, there could be a good reason. Yeah. I just don't know what it would be at this point. I the mean, brother, it's, it's so long ago. And you would think that if, you're, if you rule out foul play and you find there... You know, typically, when we cover cases like this, when someone goes missing and then their remains are eventually found, case is closed. Yeah. Usually. If if they rule they don't there's no foul play and the remains are found, case is yeah, closed. Accidental death. Accidental death. So her remains were found, yet the case as of March twenty twenty three, now I don't know if it's been since closed. I couldn't find anything on any new developments in this. And unfortunately the website find Megan Roan has gone offline now so there's been no updates mm-hmm. um, there was no new updates on the GoFundMe um, I checked Facebook for the Massachusetts State Police they've released no new statements um, it's just kind of strange that they would keep the investigation open after ruling no foul play and finding the remains I'd love to know see the forensic report to see if they can tell how long the remains have been out there yeah I don't know if they can precisely determine. I mean, it would be a few days difference. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it'd be enough to be like, oh, today versus one day versus the other. Well, no, I mean, like, have they been out there five months or one month? Like, were her roommate, was her well, body be, dumped there after the search was concluded? Or what ha, was it out there uh, close to I when get, she missing? I get what you're saying. Okay, yeah. I, I'm thinking like, well, they know when she last talked to her brother it's since no. then. Like I was, thinking, but yeah, like okay, if she was potentially murdered somewhere else, and then and they, then the killer her. put the body in the place where she was supposed to be anyway. After later on, yeah, later on. Okay, yeah. I get what you're saying. I was just curious, like I don't maybe. No, that's a good question. Yeah, like can they determine if the remains have been there for a month or five months? I mean, there's so many questions I have that yeah. I would love to get answered with the FOIA. Request. Yeah, I don't know. All right, so what's what's your official theory, then what's your off the deep end? I mean, I don't really have an off the deep end. I think if I think it sounds like this person that was stalking and harassing her really scared her and it was serious and for whatever reason this individual followed her to Massachusetts and knew she was gonna be at this inn and picked she went to that park to go hiking or scout it out. And that's the time he picked to confront her and maybe things went sideways. Like it scared, like scared her and she ran off and then he chased her. And I mean, maybe she fell and hit her head while she was being chased and the guy didn't do anything and just left. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know that. So like crime of passion, whether he did it intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah, Like he was chasing after and she accidentally fell and got injured and he was, you know, freaked out and just left, left her there. Yeah. And she passed away due to the elements or did somebody actually murder her? And then my question is, did it happen in that March time frame, or did she get abducted and then was later her remains were later? Well, returned? that's where they say there was no signs of foul play, but like there were no signs of anything. No, so ex- they found ex- her remains. Well, that's, well, that's what I'm saying. And then they made the statement though. It's like, how can you determine that? Because it's been yeah. so long. Um, well, and the, you, I get why the medical examiner is like, we can't determine cause of death from what we found. Yeah. Um, so it, was, it wasn't even from a medical exam that police just said no signs of 
foul play. The police, yeah, throughout but, the original search, they kept saying that they don't see any evidence of foul play. And then when her remains were finally found, the medical examiner said, we can't, de- we can't determine one way or the other what caused her death. See, and that's where, this is what stinks is because you've, I, again, it's not, I hopefully it's it's not the norm, but I feel like when they don't have answers, they want to close it. They make they, like it's almost like a drop down box in the case file on the computer, like uh, uh, no cause, no foul play. Because if it's foul play, like the they have to case. yeah. If it's foul play, they have to keep work because if they can't say, well, it looks like foul play anyway. Moving on, it's like well, <laughs> yeah, okay. So someone's out there who murdered her that you're and you're not going to do anything. Like that will leave an open ended question. But if you just say no foul play remains, uh, natural death or you uh, rule natural it cause, a suicide or something. Case well, not even, or just uh, unknown death, natural causes, something like that. You don't have to do anything else in the file. Well, this reminds me of the Gwen Hasselquist case. Yeah, absolutely. We, Start of COVID, like hey, it was suicide. Everybody, every single person we've talked to that knew her or is from that area or knew anything about what happened, all suspects foul play. When they hear that it was ruled. Um, did they rule it a suicide? It was, yeah, ruled a suicide. Yeah. When they hear that, everyone's just kind of like, what? Well, that was, we we only intended to do one episode and then the floodgates opened from friends, family and everything that sent us information that was like, holy cow, this is deeper and darker than we ever suspected. And it really sounds like the local law enforcement due to COVID and probably, you know, all, all the dynamics going on at that time, just like, you know what? Suicide, let's close it. We don't have time for this yeah and but you're like you said you're right this is the exact opposite the investigation is still open at least as of march 23rd 2023 and why (laughs) see that yeah that why and and this is this is where this is where if if i'm playing fair i don't know exactly how that whole system works yeah but this something doesn't seem right so at a basic level if you're in this not even in this area. If you're in law enforcement, drop us a note. You don't have to be a jerk about it either. I mean, <laughs> but just, drop us a note and just be like, yeah, this is normal and this is why. We've covered That's what enough, I would love to know. Enough of these cases of people disappearing in the wilderness, and when <clears> their <throat> remains are found and the law enforcement rules no foul play, they close it. Yeah. The case closed. Yeah, so they said no foul play, no remains. It's, it's still open, but because it's not foul play, we don't really have to put too much effort into it. Yeah. Because again, if you could imagine small town, if we have an open file with foul play, it's like there's a murder somewhere. What are you guys doing? Well, it's been a year. Uh, well, I mean, uh, are they maybe trying to not cause a panic in this town? I do remember reading several articles where, when this search was going on, people in the town, you had people saying like, "Well, before this happened, we used to leave our doors unlocked," and everyone was like, kind of scared. It's like a Dennis the Menace town. Yeah, people were before you know, it's a small uh, what's his name town. came in and. Kidnap Dennis. So, yeah, I mean, maybe are they being, you know, tight-lipped just to not panic peop- locals? I don't know. I want to look at the uh, population's 5,900, so it's a very small town. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a small town. Um, yeah. I mean, that's not an excuse to not really. It's not an excuse, but I, I'm, like, the small town politics do come into play. Yeah, but I mean, this Potentially. is the Massachusetts State Police. So it's the, I think it's the highest law enforcement agency in the state. So, I feel like they have an obligation to the public to release information pertinent about the case. If like, is there a murderer on the loose, or yeah. did this person just accidentally hit their head and pass away from the elements? I mean, why is the investigation still open? <laughs> I guess that's my question. I want to know why it's open. Well, we'll submit the FOIA and we'll yeah. we'll do an episode a year from now with an update, unless they close it or release something. Yeah. Other than that, so, so I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. I I definitely feel like something else is going on behind the scenes that we're not aware of. I would uh, I would agree with you on that. I I I there's a lot of questions still with this one. I mean, is the was the person stalking or harassing her someone of prominence and? In the town, in New York, or I in mean, New York, she was part of. This several, is uh, this is you're off the deep end, this, so you do have one. I mean, she was part of some larger organizations like Democracy Now. I've heard of before. They're pretty sure. pretty right. big. Did she upset somebody? Was somebody high up stalking her? Yeah, and 
are they keeping it quiet to protect somebody? Oh, like a powerful political figure potentially? I don't know. I mean, when they just leave some an investigation open without providing any additional information, it leads you to just... Spe- and this is all deep end stuff. Yep. yep. My opinion. I don't know any... I don't yep. want to Where get- information is scarce, opinions are high. Yeah. So, I mean, they could really squash this by just releasing some uh, new information on just... What's or, their justification? Or why is it still open? For leaving the and, case open. Yeah. Why why do they know that it's not foul play? Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. All yeah. right. I th- I think um we need our, our listeners help on this one. I want you guys to all uh write what you think was going on here. Uh or call in. That'd be cool if a couple people called in with some of their opinions because we could play those and do a, a uh an episode where everyone's giving their opinion on different cases. But yeah. Uh, other than that, thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate you all for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, uh, or X. I got to stop saying Twitter. I said X. X. Uh, where you can f- you, on YouTube, where you can also find the videos of each episode. And if you'd like to support the most sh- the show monetarily, as Mike said, you can visit our our Facebook store or the website to buy some cool swag. Or you can subscribe to get extra episodes on our Patreon account, YouTube subscriptions, Apple subscriptions, anywhere where you can subscribe, you'll get the extra stuff, you'll get extra swag in the mail, uh, and access to special events that we host for just paid subscribers. Lastly, when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time.